All right, let's get started. Uh, so, uh, so um, uh, all the uh, uh, video recordings of the previous talks, of the uh, first several talks uh, of the seminar are already available at the seminar website uh, and there are links to them uh, 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 to the YouTube videos of those talks available there. So you're welcome to watch them. Uh, after uh, uh, this talk is over, so as usual, once the uh, record, uh, once I uh, turn off the uh, record button, so you're welcome to stay on for uh, an extra period of time for uh, for a chat and a formal discussion. You don't have to disappear. Uh, so, and um, as before, uh, uh, during the talk, if you want to ask, ask a question, so just unmute yourself and ask a question, but uh, while the speaker is talking, please keep yourself on mute. So having said that, uh, I, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker. It's uh, uh, Laura Chabanov from uh, Harriet Watt University in Scotland, and she's going to tell us uh, something about today, uh, uh, about uh, computing fixed subgroups of endomorphisms in free groups. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, if I ever um, stop, if you ever stop hearing me, please, uh, I guess, make a sign in a chat or um, I, I do this with my students all the time. So I'm very happy to talk uh, here. Of course, I, I grew up uh, with the New York uh, group theory seminar. I came to New York every Friday and it was the highlight of the week. So um, very happy to, um, to be there again, even if only virtually. So um, the setup, right, so first of all, um, right, so this is work with uh, Alan Locke and also at Harriet Watt, who should be joining the talk as well. But, um, uh, the setup is, uh, is very simple. <clears throat> so we have um, just a, a free subgroup, sorry, a free group finitely generated. And we have an endomorphism um, psi. And we're um, wondering about its fixed points. So we're wondering uh, what are those points x for which psi of x is equal to x. Um, that's a set that can be proved very quickly to be a subgroup. And so uh, we're going to call the fixed subgroup or rather denote the fixed subgroup of this map um, like that. So fix of psi. So um, as soon as you have a, a subgroup in a free group, you wonder, uh, well, first of all, you know it is free, but there's a few things you'd like to know. So for example, um, is it finitely generated? Is it, um, is it a bounded rank, as in, um, is the rank of fixify bounded in some way? And then, uh, can we compute it? Can we compute the subgroup? And that would mean uh, find the rank and find the basis. How much can we say about it? And, um, well, the answers to these questions are um, mostly known, not everything. But let me start with the first part. So the answer is yes. So the fixed subgroup for, for any endomorphism psi is, um, is finitely generated. And then for the second question, um, that's a very interesting one. Um, it was conjectured for a long time that the rank of the subgroup is smaller than the rank of F, the, am the ambient group. And this was called the Scott conjecture from, I think- The, the endomorphism way. doesn't have to be injective here, correct? No, 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 just any, anything, right? It, this is just any map. Uh, any endomorphism. So, um, so this, um, this inequality was a conjecture in the 70s, which was called the Scott conjecture, and it was solved positively. And so, yes, the answer is yes for really any, any psi. And um, well, there's many names that should be mentioned here for both answers. Uh, these are not uh, obvious in any way. So Kirsten, one of the first who proved, I believe that for automorphisms that this is finally generated then came work for endomorphisms. Um, and then, um, right, Imlich and Turner did lots of work. Um, and then um, the final answer to the Scott conjecture, um, in other words, proving that this inequality holds is due to Besfina and Handel. And um, this is a very important work. Um, and, um, in the 80s and 90s, this was a very active area. So a lot of these conjectures or partial conjectures were, were proved. And um, part of the story is that uh, Besfina and Handel uh, um, developed train tracks, uh, train track representatives, so topological 
objects to deal with automorphism free groups uh, motivated by, by these conjectures. So they studied um, automorphisms and, um, and in particular, well, and developed this machinery and in particular proved um, this inequality here. Um, so um, there is a great survey of Enrique Ventura, uh, which appeared in, in uh, 2002. And he's, he's going over um, a lot of, of the work and the techniques that were developed uh, then. Um, and of course, um, there's many names that I haven't mentioned, but hopefully I, I will mention them along the way. So these were the questions about uh, finite generation and bound on the rank. So there's a third question here, right? Can we compute the basis? And uh, what about that question? So that's question, my question three. What about computing exactly the rank and the basis? Um, so every now and then I'm gonna take, I have snippets from the paper and uh, so uh, don't worry about the numbers here on, on the questions, just from the paper. So this is, um, well, Stallings asked this already in 1984 and um, simply ask, is there an algorithm um, which uh, given an endomorphism um, outputs the rank? And um, well, there, um, there, is, there are two sides of the story. So one side is that if you're looking at automorphisms, um, as I said, we have a lot of techniques and machinery to deal with them, uh, but a lot less uh, for non-automorphisms. So this is why I have automorphisms versus general endomorphisms. So there are major differences between these and how well these are understood and the kind of techniques we have to deal with them. So to get started with the automorphisms, I already mentioned that there are tools to study them. Um, and the train tracks, of course, have been uh, used uh, way beyond fixed subgroups, um, as, as most of you know. But uh, as far as we're concerned here, they were used to give an algorithm to compute a basis for the fixed subgroup of an automorphism, okay? And um, so this is um, this um, paper about Bog Bogopolsky Masakova from the, uh, 2016 and the different approach of Fein Handel from uh, uh, 2018. And um, somewhat connected, um, I'll get back to this later. We'll see how much time I have. Um, the twisted conjugacy, um, again, if you don't know what, what it is, no problem, but in free groups is also is not decidable and it connects um, to this other story. Um, and um, this is to contrast it to what we have for general endomorphisms, right? So for non-injective or non-subjective, um, uh, what happens there is that um, there, there was a preprint from 2010 unpublished um, um, trying to create this uh, train track representatives for general endomorphisms. Um, so that was uh, about 10 years ago and then um, the, um, most of the results we have are recent uh, from Mutang Guha. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say his name. Um, so um, it's going towards developing a theory of train tracks for uh, general endomorphisms. And as I said, related, but um, the connection will be more obvious at the end, um, is the fact that, for example, if we have a, a, a general endomorphism, the twisted conjugacy problem is not known to be decidable. So what is that? Um, well, you all know the conjugacy problem. So um, you start as usual with two elements, G and H, but you also have some, some a map, uh, an endomorphism. And the question is, is there an element X such that um, psi of X, uh, G, X inverse is equal to H? So it's conjugation, but on one side you have um, psi of x instead of um, just x. And um, if this is not an automorphism, we don't really know. Uh, if it is decidable, we don't know much about it. Um, and um, it, it plays a role in, in um, fixed subgroups as well. So, um, so going back to the question, can we compute the rank and, uh, of, of a fixed subgroup? And um, <clears throat> Um, well, this is what I want to tell you about today. So this question of Stallings, um, which was, um, I mean, um, 
some motivation and and um, um, well enthusiasm was generated also by the meeting in Dutch to last year where there was a lot of talk about um, fixed groups or maybe less that but the post correspondence problem for free groups and things around there um, so this uh, this remains open in general we don't know how to compute the rank of a fixed up group or find the basis but what I want to tell you about today is the work with Alan which is that if we're looking just at a map in the um, um, group on two generators, free group on two generators, then we do know how to find the basis. And um, so this is uh, dealing with the free group of rank two. And the corollary of this is that um, given again an endomorphism in F2, there is an algorithm to compute the basis for the stable image of F2. And now I'll tell you what that is. Um, so the stable image of an endomorphism is taking the image, right? So taking um, psi of f and then the iterated image, psi uh, two of f and uh, three and so on, and taking the intersections of all these guys. And again, that can be se um, seen fairly quickly. This, is, uh, this intersection is, um, is a subgroup and it's denoted with f infinity of f. And uh, this is very, very tiny here. I don't know if you see. Um, so this was um, used um, to a um, great degree with a lot of success by Imrich and Turner, first of all, in studying fixed subgroups, um, and then by uh, Armando Martino, Enrique Ventura, and others. Uh, Warren Dick should be mentioned in the story as well. So a uh, very nice object, very nice subgroup. And um, I, I will try to prove the corollary on this at the end of the talk. We'll see how we stay with time. I haven't given this talk uh, on Zoom in any case, so um, I have no idea um, how fast I go. But um, right, so an observation, immediate observation is, of course, any fixed uh, point of a map is going to be in the image of a map and in any iteration of the map. So the fixed subgroup is definitely a subgroup of the stable image. Uh, what else can we notice? Okay, so that's the stable image. Uh, well, it takes a bit of work, and this was due to Turner from about 96, I think, that this is a retract, okay, this subgroup. And um, without too much work, I think you can show that the fixed points of, um, of, this, of, a map, of any map, of any endo, is the same as the fixed points of, of the map restricted to the stable subgroup. So if this is somehow fast or too many symbols, don't worry, we'll get to that uh, eventually. Um, more importantly even is that this map will act as an automorphism on the stable image. Okay, so, um, so restricted to the uh, stable subgroup is, um, gives you the same fixed points as what you wanted, well, what we want, the, the initial sub fixed subgroup. And moreover, it acts as an automorphism uh, there just restricted to that. And this is again due to Imre and Turner. And why am I telling you this? Because um, um, if you connect facts two and three, right? So the fact that the fixed, sub, the fixed points uh, can be studied as fixed points within the stable image, and that on that stable image, you actually have an automorphism, then we could use the, the algorithms for automorphism of Bogopolsky and uh, Maslakova, uh, sorry, all the names that I mentioned before to compute the fixed points. So you could take this approach, understand this, and then understand that because uh, on this bit, this is just an automorphism and we know how to deal with automorphisms. Um, so in view of that, uh, well, uh, Enrique, who's uh, uh, very, very fond of fixed up group, he, he asked uh, for a while and also in Dutch tool, um, um, can we compute the basis for the stable image? Because if we did, then we'll find a fixed up group. Um, and uh, well, it turns out actually in this paper, we, we go the other way around. Um, so we in fact compute first the fixed up group and then we compute from it the stable image and that's going to be at the end. 
again for uh, F2. So let's see, Let, let's get to, um, to uh, showing a few things. So how are we going to compute this fix up group in F2? Well, uh, for, for any free group, um, uh, it's Hopfi and so uh, what kind of maps can you have? Well, either injective, surjective, so autos, or injective but not surjective, or not injective, not surjective. So you cannot have surjective but not injective, right? So that's three types of, of maps. And uh, I'm not gonna get into this, uh, but it's very easy to determine uh, in which case you are to, with some stalling foldings or, or whichever tool you prefer. So there's three cases. I already mentioned that the automorphisms um, have been dealt with. So there's the general uh, proof for any um, rank, but uh, for rank two, it was already done by Bogopolsky uh, in 2000. So then what do we have left to do? Uh, so Alan and I would looked at um, maps that are injective but not surjective, or injective, sorry, not injective, not surjective. And it turns out that this is pretty easy. And this uh, is surprisingly hard, or at least the, the method that we have. And uh, to not intimidate everyone and scare everyone, uh, I'm gonna start with the easy case. <laughs> But before I get there, um, let's just see where are we now. Well, we're trying to compute the fix-up group by all the results I showed you. The rank is less than the rank of the ambient group, which is two. So we really have three possibilities. Either the fix-up group is trivial, or it's cyclic, or has rank two. But again, by previous results, um, you can only have rank two if your map is, a, is an automorphism. So, uh, so there's really a choice between uh, trivial or cyclic, which sounds easy, but again, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be, uh, at least not what we've done. So the easy case is when the map is not injective. So if the map is not injective, uh, we know that the image has to be cyclic. So let's say it's generated by some word W. Uh, which again, it's easily computable. We, we do some stolic foldings or anything like that. And suppose that uh, the fix up group is not trivial, then again, since fix up group is in the image of the map, um, and we know that, um, uh, right, so if it's in there, then in particular, um, it's going to have elements of the form W to some power. So, if W to some power is fixed because there's unique roots in a free, sub, in a free group, free subgroup, uh, it means that W itself is being fixed. Um, e very easy to check. Obviously, we have the map sign in front of us. And, um, and so um, if this happens, then the fixed subgroup is exactly the image generated by W. If not, then uh, the fixed subgroup is trivial. So I think I have an example, yes. I realized that this is a talk without pictures, which is not good. Um, so at least I, I should have examples. Um, so, uh, right, so here we have a map, right? Just uh, Psi of A is given by that, Psi of B is given by this. You stare at them for a second, you realize, oh, this is a, a square of BAB inverse, that's a cube of BAB inverse. So of course it is not injective, the image has rank one and it is in fact this uh, and then you're asking yourself by the previous lemma is is this element the basis itself fixed and you can just plug in uh, using the, the values and you get in fact no the image of this is the square so since we don't get this it means that actually the fix up group is trivial okay so this was the easy case now, the hard case is when the map is injective. Uh, and of course, we're not an uh, automorphic, so it cannot be subjective. Again, this is the hard case, but we're starting with an easy lemma. Uh, so what does the easy lemma say? It says that um, if uh, the map is uh, injective and you do have some fixed point, then that point has to be, um, well, essentially uh, a power of a primitive, or rather that there must be a primitive fixed by this map. So how does the proof work? 
Well, again, we have our map, which is injective, and there's a result of Turner. Uh, and this is why I mentioned um, um, a few things about the stable image earlier. Um, turns out that the stable image, anytime the map is injected, is in fact a, a, a free factor, which is a proper free factor of F2. So uh, now I'm going to attempt to write something. So, but now, um, since we know that um, uh, the fixed of the map is always inside the stable image. Um, and we just said, we assumed here that there is some point in there, so this is not trivial. Um, and well, this is, uh, we just said it is a free factor, right? So this must be generated by some element which is primitive. Right, because of, of being, it is a, a proper free factor. And so all of this implies that um, um, uh, psi of, of something in here in the subroof x to the i is equal to x to the i. But again, we have unique roots, so we have just psi of x is equal to x. Okay, so that's that's very nice. That if uh, what it says is that if you have a fixed point, then you have to have a primitive fixed point. Which again sounds like things should be easy because we understand primitives really well in in free groups of rank two. But um, well, we'll get there. So the corollary just that if we have a monomorphism, um, then this fixed subgroup is either generated by a primitive or is trivial. So if you want, we have to just decide is the fixed subgroup trivial or not, and if it's not, find the primitive element that generates it. And uh, yeah, another example. Actually, this is my only picture, I think. Um, so again, to try to uh, to think about this case. So so this is my map here. Psi of a is a to the minus two b and uh, b squared a. I drew here the little core graph. Uh, you can fold it a bit, but in any case, you see it is injective and not surjective. And again, this is the, the main part of the paper, the main part of the proof. So this fixed subgroup is either trivial or is generated by a primitive element. And I'm going to get back to it to see what happens. So our strategy is to uh, first find the fixed points x up to conjugation. So we can't quite get them immediately, the fixed points, but we first get the con conjugacy classes that are being fixed. And because they're conjugacy classes, we call them outer fixed points. And also something I'm not going to say all the time, but just uh, my, my, my tongue will twist and um, so, we're, of course, if, you, um, if you're interested in the fixed points, you might as well look at non-powers, right? So, um, which we call uh, maximal outer fixed points. So, I'm not going to say maximal all the time. Uh, of course, if, if X is being fixed and any power is fixed and uh, the other way around. So, I'll just say outer fixed point for this. Uh, but most of the time, I'm assuming is not a power. So once we figure out the outer fixed points, we will determine the fixed points from them. That's gonna be the strategy. And um, again, there will be a couple of cases to, to look at, but um, let me just say that um, in all cases, we will use the abelianization of the free group. So I call it pi. And um, uh, right now on this slide, I'm using it to build a matrix uh, which I call the abelianization matrix of the map, uh, which if we were talking about automorphism, it would be just, uh, you know, the map from odd F2 into GL2Z or something like that. But of course, we're not talking about automorphism, so we just call it um, well, associated matrix or abelianization matrix. Uh, so it contains the abelianization of the images of the map. And here I have an example. It's actually the example from before. Uh, that, so you see, uh, what's the abelianization of this is minus two, one, right? So that is uh, the abelianization of the image of A. And of course, uh, here, abelianization of this guy here. 
And what will play a role is the determinant of the matrix. So here the determinant is minus five. How does it play a role? Well, we're going to split these. Again, remember, we're looking at monomorphisms. Everything is injective and we're going to split them into those that are close to being automorphisms in the sense that their determinant is plus minus one. Um, so, and, and those that are far from automorphisms, again, this is all very informal, just to give you an intuition where the determinant is not plus minus one. And so this matrix here is determinant minus five, so it's, it's in this second case here. And again, turns out the ones that are closer to being automorphisms are harder, and the ones that are uh, farther away from being automorphisms are easier. And as, uh, as, as you see by now, I always start with the easy case. Um, that's what I do with my students too, to give everyone courage. So uh, in the easy case, meaning you're far from being an automorphism, uh, again, we're working with the abelianization pi, and let's see how do we work with that. This is my map from earlier. This is the associated matrix. And I'm just looking at uh, how you can fix uh, a point. But because we're working with the abelianization, we can't quite talk about fixed points. We have to talk about fixed points up to conjugation. So when is psi of W conjugate to W? Well, take the, um, well, the action of this matrix on the abelianization. So here I have pi of W. The abelianization of W is alpha beta, that's the notation. And you're fixing W, uh, or in the sense, if, if you have this uh, identity here, just I'll be nice. And um, this is linear algebra. Um, I have <laughs> written, so again, so W is an outer fixed point. If this happens, then you solve this. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's an eigenvalue of a source of vector, sorry. And uh, if you work it out, turns out actually the only values are uh, zero. So you might say, well, there are plenty of elements with uh, zero, zero abelianization. But remember, W, the, the, the fixed point and outer fixed point should be a primitive. Uh, so it cannot abelianize to zero, zero. So in this case, uh, which is the example I started with a while back, so there are no outer fixed points. And of course, if there's no after fixed points, there's no fixed points either. Uh, so this settles this particular example. And I showed you this because of, uh, well, just to see a bit the method. Uh, this is another example, um, just something slightly different happens here. So there's just another map. It's matrix, the determinant is uh, four minus one, so it seems to be three. And uh, again, uh, you find uh, an outer fixed point W if this uh, bit of linear algebra happens. You can check the linear algebra, but the point is that, remember, alpha, beta should be co-prime because they come from a primitive element. So if you solve that, you should get, in fact, alpha, beta is equal to um, just one, one. I mean, so of course, at a solute purely at linear algebraic solutions, there would be any numbers n, n here, but we're talking about primitive elements. So now what is the primitive, what, what primitive uh, conjugacy class should I choose with this abelianization? Well, there is a unique uh, primitive conjugacy class, right, with, uh, with abelianization um, equal to one, one. And that is uh, I'm just going to uh, just take AB. So um, just looking at uh, later on, not forgetting anything. So that's just uh, that. Um, and now I want to check, is this really uh, an outer fixed point, AB? And then you have to check. If you plug in the, this, you get uh, you want to check is a psi of AB conjugate to AB. And when you plug in, I mean, we know the values here, right? And you, you, you get uh, AB inverse, AB B inverse. So uh, you see it, you are conjugate. And that means in fact here, 
we do have an outer fixed point. Okay, so unlike the previous example. So the case that I told you is relatively easy because it, it, it sort of works with linear algebraic methods is, um, is this one, right? It's, we have a monomorphism uh, where the determinant is not plus minus one. And the conclusion that we got is that there is a, um, a not unique outer fixed point actually. So I didn't show you a proof, I just show you examples which hopefully are convincing enough that this is where it's going. So um, uh, either has sort of trivial uh, outer fixed point or has two outer fixed points, which are just X and its inverse. And X is primitive. So uh, this was the, the case that was far from being an automorphism. And now for the other case, which is uh, a lot more involved. Um, again, remember we're trying to find the outer fixed points that are not powers. That's what maximum means. And we're looking at the case where the determinant is plus or minus one. Oh, so now there's a bit too much on the slide, but let's go slowly. Um, so our approach here, there, there's three steps. So it's step one, um, determine if there exist any outer fixed points of some power of psi. Okay, so we're approaching this from very far away, uh, not fixed points of the map itself, but is there a power that has some outer fixed point? That's step one. Then step two is um, if, we, um, if we do find such a point and such a power, so if something like this happen, happens, um, and we, we, uh, we know the P and the X in here, then actually find out all the maximal outer fixed points, not, not just the, the one from step one. And the step three is in fact easy. Um, if you do know fixed points of a power of a map, uh, it takes a couple of seconds to think about it, you can actually find the outer fixed points of the map itself because they're a subset of those from here. Okay, so let's uh, get started with step one. This is the really nice, um, I think, uh, story. And so uh, we're, again, the step one is, can we find a K such that Psi to the K has an outer fixed point? And we're going to look at the mapping torus of, of this map Psi. And we're going, which is, sorry, which is uh, right there, this, this uh, little um, HNN extension. So um, A, B are the generators of the free group and we have the stable letter T and A conjugated by T is the image of A and, and so on. So we're going to look at, connect our question to the hyperbolicity or rather lack thereof um, of this group. And um, some of you, um, I think, are well aware of, of some, some very nice work from the 90s. Um, this has been studied, that this, uh, this group, and in particular its hyperbolicity, when the map is an automorphism. And, um, and then Ilya has a very nice paper from 2000, uh, which I think has the uh, Rutgers address on it. So uh, I was there. But um, so when uh, the map is an immersion, then, um, then also connecting um, the, well, you see some sort of fixed points, which he calls periodic conjugacy classes um, to this group. So now let me expand on what I mean with all of this. So again, this is the group that I'm interested in. Um, if you just write out these things a bit carefully and you assume that there is an outer fixed point of this, you will get just um, really a relation that shows you that there is, uh, so, so if you have a fixed point of this guy, an outer fixed point, so you call it W, you write out what it means to be, so um, uh, sorry, K of G is some W, uh, G, W inverse. Um, you write all that out and you'll see you contain uh, Z squared in there. Okay, so another fixed point means you have a, a Z squared, which of course 
implies that the group is not hyperbolic. And now if we do the negation of the statement, if the group is not hyperbolic, this is what I have here. Sorry, the negation of this is that if uh, the group is hyperbolic, then uh, this guy does not have outer fixed points for any k. And again, um, so um, it's, it's not yet clear how we're connecting it to, to fixed points. Um, we're still talking about this group, but now I think it's coming on this slide. Almost, yes. So here I'm supposed to write on top of my grade, but I might not. So understanding still, uh, I, I won't finish this. It's a very, um, it's understanding when this group is not hyperbolic. So um, suppose we have such a, an identity in the group. So we're just in, in the free group for now. And suppose we have something that almost looks like an outer fixed point. So this X here, except it's not quite. So we have the mapped power P of X is a conjugate of some other power of X. Okay, so we have this identity. Um, now, if you think of this instead of um, the free group, remember in, in the mapping, no mapping class group, in the mapping torus, um, this is equal to that. Rewrite things a bit. Um, and then I do have to copy this on because there's no way I'm going to write it correctly. So if you, if you do this rewriting here, what you get is that H Y H inverse is equal to Y to the P in the mapping torus. And now Ilya proved that, um, that in fact, so of course you look at this and you see, well, this is a bump stock solitar relator. Um, and it's not just sitting in the group, it's you really have um, uh, Baumstock Solitar um, embedded in there. And, um, and in particular, and then, then again, uh, standard result is that if you have a Baumstock Solitar group in your group, uh, you cannot, this cannot be hyperbolic. So the conclusion here is that M psi is not hyperbolic, and that is important. Okay, so we started with this, this um, identity that looks like an outer fixed point almost, except there's some pesky exponents there. And we concluded that the group is not hyperbolic. And turns out, okay, so uh, this is where we are. We started with this. We showed the group is not hyperbolic, but turns out by, as I said, by uh, one of the recent papers of uh, Danguha, that the other direction works as well. So um, if the group is not hyperbolic, uh, my, oh, why did my style stopped working? I don't know. Um, hmm. I wonder if it ran out of battery just now. Can't believe it. Right, so I'll just talk. Um, right, so if, if the group is, is not hyperbolic, then the identity uh, holds. So again, what do I mean the identity holds? Well, let's look at the statement. It says that um, so the group is hyperbolic if and if um, this identity will never hold, right? So here, I'm sorry, I mean, it's, it's going between the negation of a statement and the statement, so hopefully it's not too confusing. Here I'm talking about the group is hyperbolic, which is the negation of this, if and only if you never have anything like this for any X and for any P and Q. Okay, so both directions work. And so this is the setup in which we hope, well, in which we have any hope or any chance to, do, to have some outer fixed points. Um, from the previous lemmas, if you remember, we connected outer fixed points uh, with the group not being hyperbolic, and so, and that connects to having some identities like that. So hopefully it's not all too uh, much in technical. Uh, well, just a bit more technical bit, which is simplifying the picture. If we have such a, a funny identity, 
but we do know that there is, so if, if the map does have an outer fixed point, so no, no power, just regular outer fixed point, then in fact this Q has to be one or minus one. So it's not as bad as it looks. So we can in fact reduce this because we assume, so if the map has an outer fixed point, then uh, instead of working with that, we can work with this. And now I think comes the punchline, um, which, um, so I'll give you the proof, that's the punchline really, but the, the proposition says that there is an algorithm which determines whether or not uh, we can find a K um, such that psi to the K has an outer fixed point. And if it does have such a point, then we can find both K, the power, and the outer fixed point. So how does the proof or the algorithm work really? Well, um, by all the previous results I, I've told you, we have either the group, the, the, the mapping torus is hyperbolic or, this is the or here, some, some identity like this holds. So one or the other has to happen. And this is very similar to Ilya's algorithm from, from his paper. Um, so running parallel, the algorithm looking either for a delta of constant of hyperbolicity for, for this group, or looking for x, p, q, um, such that something like that holds. Because one or the other has to happen, this algorithm will terminate. Of course, it's not an effective, efficient algorithm, but it will terminate. And what does this say? Again, so same story. So either look for hyperbolicity or for an identity like that. Um, well, so when it terminates, if it found that the group is hyperbolic from, from some lemma uh, a few slides ago, there's no outer fixed points. If we do find an identity like that, okay, so if we find something like this, then remember there was another lemma which said uh, Q really has to be plus or minus one if there is a, an outer fixed point. So if it's not, then there's no fixed point, so we're done. And finally, if Q is plus minus one, that what we really have is this. So again, it is an outer fixed point um, of, of uh, power of psi. And you see there's a plus minus here, and so really uh, what we get is an outer fixed point of uh, psi of 2p, uh, but that's uh, just a small thing. And so then in this case, we, we know that uh, there's some outer fixed points. Right, so where are we now? So again, we are looking at injective size um, for which the associated determinant, the matrix determinant was plus minus one. And uh, so far we managed to determine if there, uh, some power of the map has some outer fixed point. If we found such uh, powers and, and fixed points, right? So with something like this was just on the previous slide. Now we would like to find uh, all the outer fixed points, right? For, so far we just found one of them. And uh, step three, which I won't get back to is, as I said, um, if you know the fixed points of a power of a map, you can check among them, there will be the fixed points of the map itself. Again, talk about outer fixed points still, we're not at fixed points yet. And there's a theorem which I'm uh, going to go relatively quickly over, which just says that um, if you have a monomorphism with the right determinant, then there's at most two uh, outer fixed points. And um, if we know one, we, we can find the other. And more importantly, the two of them form a free basis. So let's just see an example maybe better. Again, this is a map here um, where, um, Okay, A is being fixed, sure, that's why we have a fixed point, but uh, B is this. And it turns out that this map has um, two outer maximal fixed points, right? So uh, A, which was obvious, but also a second one here. And of course the inverse is we put them separately because technically they're, they're not in the same conjugacy class, but uh, yeah, they, they come for free. So this uh, we thought is quite interesting that uh, remember, I told you um, only automorphisms can have two fixed points, 
but it turns out that you can have um, monomorphisms with two outer fixed points. So I thought that's, uh, yeah, that, that's nice. How do we do that? Well, I'm running slightly out of time. Um, this is a point where we do use um, the classification of primitives in F2. Uh, actually, you have 60 yeah. minutes, so you don't, you're not. Yeah, I know, I know, but I have more slides. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, I'm, I'm fine, yeah. Thanks. So, um, right, so at this point, we, um, we do take advantage of, of primitives in F2. Um, right, the, these are well understood. It's, it's uh, one of my favorite things to play with, uh, combinatorial, there are lots of combinatorial nice things about them. Um, but um, let's just say that, um, so the, uh, whenever you have a map, you can, you can uh, do some conjugation change basis. So you can actually assume that your map fixes A. Well, sorry, at this point, we know that we're assuming there is an outer fixed point from everything we've done up to now. So that outer fixed point, so we, 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 we can reduce everything we're doing to this assumption. And then uh, suppose we have a, a second outer fixed point that we're trying to determine. So this is a Y here. From the theorem that I went very fast over, um, X and Y, so in particular A and B in my example, have to form a free basis. So A is primitive, Y has to be primitive. And with quite a lot of work and using this, the shape of primitives, we actually get uh, that Y has to look like this. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's not much more to say. It, it takes uh, essentially combinatorics on words and then looking carefully at this. Um, and then uh, we know Y and we can actually tell when a map, if you give me a map um, with A being fixed, then um, we can tell on the, based on the shape of psi of B, uh, whether it has two outer fixed points or just one or what happens. Okay, so yeah, actually I'm, I'm not doing too bad. Um, so, so far we've been um, computing outer fixed points and now we're in fact done. Because from this point here, um, yeah, we can really tell um, almost, yeah, we can tell everything we want about outer fixed points. I mean, from this bit, we can, uh, as I said, this, um, this is not a restriction. We, you can easily reduce from a general map to with outer fixed points to this. Right, so we know the outer fixed points up to conjugation. Now we need to find the fixed points. So how do we do that? Well, uh, just the, recall that psi was injective but not rejective. And we know the outer fixed points. Again, from what I've told you, change careful change of basis and conjugation, it suffices to assume that one of these outer fixed points is actually uh, A. Well, it's conjugacy class because it's an outer fixed point. All right, so for the last five minutes or so, um, I'm going to assume that um, uh, A is being fixed like that. So psi of A is conjugate to A. Right, so what does that mean? Well, it means that psi of A looks like this, like, uh, well, P is some, of course, some element uh, in and P and Q, which are some words in F2. And so the map looks like that. Q is just anything, right? Um, the point is that, that this um, A is being fixed. And now the goal is to find the primitive X that is being fixed by Psi, if it exists, of course. So um, now there's going to be, I think, a slide that's a little bit busy. So I'll try to go slow. So there's a, a bit of uh, magic uh, in <laughs> computations in the background. But let's just say, so if we take Z to be, well, this word based on the P and the Q, so a constant. And somehow, this equation uh, holds. So what is this equation? P is W of A and uh, B substituted by Z, which is a constant, times A to the minus K for some power K times W. Okay, so if this holds, where W is unknown, 
right? So, sorry, so, so uh, P, Q, Z are all constants, um, but if there exists a W and a K such that this holds, turns out miraculously that we're going to be able to find a fixed point. So how do we do that? Well, I really didn't want to go through the computations. It's this bit here. And so I don't expect anyone to be able to read that, except that you start here and you do all these substitutions and you get here. And that's what I have here. So, um, so if you have such a word that satisfies this kind of fun equation, it's not really an equation in the classical sense, uh, you get the, that this uh, W A W inverse is a fixed point. And I'm saying it's the fixed point because remember there's a single, well, there's a, this primitive uh, element that generates the fixed subgroup. So let's, um, uh, this is uh, I'm sure a bit hard to uh, digest like that, a lot of formulas, but again, uh, so what we have is some constant words. So this is just a word that is given uh, we assume that we have a word W and an integer K such that this holds, and we get the fixed point out of it. So what do we need to get the fixed point? Well, let's look here again. Um, we, um, we need the W from this equation because A is A, so, um, so we need that. And now if you look at it just a little bit, what is W of A, Z? Well, um, you could not write it that way. You could write it differently. You could say if, if this is a map which sends A to A and B to Z, then W of A, Z is simply Psi, Z, sorry, Phi, is it Phi? Is it, yeah, Phi um, of W, uh, A to the minus K W. So this is where uh, I promised you that the twisted conjugacy problem appears. You see, if you look at this, right, there's a W. Oh, unbelievable. Um, yeah, my, my pencil seems to run out of battery. Right, so, um, so if you stare at this in blue, um, you see a twisted conjugacy problem uh, where the map is this uh, phi of z. What am I conju twisting conjugating? Um, I'm conjugating P and a to the minus k, and actually I do not know what k is, and that's another story, but, um, but it is a twisted conjugacy problem for this and that. So p is definitely given, um, and that is, um, um, it, it's not too bad the fact that we don't know the k. But it's not just a twisted conjugacy problem in the sense of does such a w exist, I also want to find it. And if somebody uh, solved the twisted conjugacy problem for in free groups for endomorphisms, then um, it would save us uh, a lot of pain uh, to solve this. So, so this here, this sort of equation looking thing is equivalent to this twisted conjugacy problem. And um, so what we did uh, was actually um, deal with this equation um, try to find from, from the Z and the P and so on, um, find the W. And uh, it took uh, a lot of technical combinatorial arguments to, to deal with that. So it's a, it's a small case of a general twisted conjugacy problem and yet it was really painful. Uh, but we got uh, the W and the K. And so remember from, from this computation here, which is probably even smaller than a few slides ago, this means we got a fixed point. So that's the end of the main result. That's my <laughs> big check mark. Um, but yeah, no, no details on this. Uh, that's about I don't know, eight, nine pages of, of uh, technical um, computations. But now I think I do have time for the corollary. I have just uh, a few minutes. Um, so this is quite nice. Remember, um, it was about computing the stable image of, uh, of a map in F2. So first of all, if the map is surjective, right, then the stable image, well, the image <laughs> is just the whole group, right, then any iteration is that. So, so clearly the stable image is just um, F2, so there's nothing to do. So what is interesting, it's when the map is not surjective. 
And now, um, again, this is, um, this is uh, Turner's result was, who said, who said, the result said, yeah, that uh, the stable image is a proper retract and um, we are in F2. So it, it is um, trivial or uh, cyclic group. And now again, if you remember from uh, beginning, the beginning of the talk, that the map um, acts um, as an automorphism on the stable image, but groups like the trivial one and Z do not have many automorphisms, right? So actually they, they, they are very boring automorphisms. In fact, um, uh, if you take the square, you're, you're, you're getting a trivial map. So this uh, map acts trivially on the stable image. So if you act trivially, um, in particular, the stable image is now included in or subgroup in the fix of the square of the map. And now the end just says so we have this, but in general, uh, the fix subgroup of a map is inside the stable image of that map. And then uh, a small observation shows that um, this stable image is the same as that because, well, iterations they don't matter, you jump from two to two. And so you get finally that the fix of the square of the map is a stable, um, the stable image. And we have shown how to compute this uh, fix subgroup. And this is how we get the stable image. Um, so um, these are the two main results we had and uh, they are both in the paper which is on the archive. And this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank the speaker. Thanks. All right. Now, if there are any questions to Laura, you're welcome to ask them. Questions, comments, anything? very nice like very nice results very thank nice you mix. so uh, mm -hmm. i had some questions yeah. comments something so sure. you're not using here train track machinery for these results right uh we are not but we're using the result that is uh, so um if you know how to pronounce his name uh, mutanguha yes he uh, uh, yeah, right, yeah. because he started developing some train track machinery for yeah. the models, right? So uh, in here, implicitly, yeah, yeah. there's because something because going on in the back, I mean, this, this bit. The, the reason I asked is because I would imagine that once, like, a full version of uh, something like improved relative train tracks is mm -hmm. developed, Mm -hmm. or this endomorphisms, uh, mm -hmm. this stuff should get easier, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm you should be able to use uh, all this stuff this uh, uh, periodic and, yeah. piece and yeah. piece compute all this uh, fixed mm -hmm. uh, subgroups mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that's what i would have thought you know but i think that that machinery itself is very technical and difficult uh, to set up so you, yes you walk around it i mean that's what uh, <laughs> what i see here right <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. as i said if, if there's anything it's it's in here and yeah I see. So uh, some train tracks are hidden. He, he's using that to, to prove this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Laura. It's Alexi. Hi. Hi. <laughs> nice results. Thank Actual you. Actual question, though. Uh, yeah. So post correspondence problem for F2. Uh -huh. <laughs> how, how far you are from this? Because it's very much related to the twisted conjugate yes, problem. Yes, that's what we thought we were going to prove, but at the end we realized we don't quite have the, yeah. I mean, that's where we're going with this, really. But, um, but do you have any partial results or something like this? Uh, probably for some maps, yeah, we can say some things, but um, uh, I mean, that we, we thought we actually have the PCP for F2, but um, there was something that we were missing. Mm. And to be honest, it's a bit late. It's 10 p.m. So I don't remember what we are missing right now, but I'm happy to tell you. So uh, could you remind yeah. for the audience what the post correspondence sure, is? Sure, sure. It's just a, a more, um, well, I mean, let's just go to, uh, I don't seem to, yeah. So it's just, uh, it's just, um, if you have two maps, and let me call them F and G, 
So F and G just from F2 to F2. It's just really um, the looking at the equalizer of the maps F and G, which is just all the points X in F2, of course, such that F of X is equal to G of X. And the question is, um, is, um, is this equalizer uh, trivial or not? It's uh, G. So F and G are homomorphisms here, right? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, and those, uh-huh. And um, I mean, so this comes, right? So, so if, if you had monomorphisms here, so no more, uh, sorry, monoids, free, free monoids, free semigroups, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so if you have uh, free semigroups here, this is right to the postcard. So this, this question of, is there anything that makes these, uh, these maps equal is one of the most famous problems in computer science. Um, and for free groups, uh, it, it comes down to equalizers. Um, and for F2, yes, yeah, so, so we were close, but um, something didn't work and it's, it's been a few months now, so I don't remember because then we tried to just uh, write down what we do have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah, it's, um, that's a very interesting problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I could add here that the equalizer yes. has can have rank at most two, mm -hmm. whereas we were explicitly using the fact that the fixed subgroup was either trivial or cyclic. So there's already a jump in 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 rank. So our ideas mm -hmm. will work as well. <laughs> so there are some cases where you can say things. I mean, for uh, yeah, but. Ah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right. well, it's, it's, it's good to hear you. I don't see you, Alexei, but... <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. It's, I, I um... saw you. I saw you last week, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other comments, questions, remarks? So I just wanted to say I'm also very happy to hear this talk I very much like the results and I think to me they just demonstrate uh, that the time of the morphisms has arrived you know so the, <laughs> the results being told about them now that are very interesting so I think people should stop <laughs> thinking about them more seriously so thank mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. all right uh, well thank uh, let us thank Laura once again thank you okay so now I'm going to stop the recording and uh...